Okay, guys. So uh, thanks for coming. And I'm going to talk to you about the user space packet processing. It's not something too new about, um, but interestingly enough, I keep being asked questions in this area. So I thought it could be something good uh, to speak about here at the labs conference. Um, it's by far not an exhaustive talk. Uh, we could speak about these both technologies for days. So this wants just to be a trigger for people if they are interested to, to learn more about it. And just out of curiosity before I start, who has heard about DPDK and DPP? Okay, good. So it's not a surprise. <laughs> um, as just as a brief introduction, uh, I was in 2010 the lead engineer on DPDK when we when it started. And I've been a committer on BPP for a year or so, authoring SCTP and the Geneva Tunnel implementation for, for the protocol stack. So let's start with DPDK. So a little bit of a background, why this project started, and it was started at Intel, again, back in 2010. Uh, at in those days, we were talking about line rates uh, to be achieved for 10 gigabit, which is what uh, Antonio was talking about earlier. And I'll show you eventually what the numbers look like today. Uh, but 2010 was like uh, 10 gigabit was what people wanted to, to, to see as a you know, throughput for a one core processing. And um, sadly enough, it wasn't really possible through the kernel networking stack. Uh, for all series of reasons, and, and, and I'll, I'll show you how DPDK actually goes around the limitation that the kernel has, or the not the limitation, but rather uh, the, the huge stack that the kernel has. Um, at the time, there were lots of competing requirements, as you would expect. Uh, obviously, meeting the performance requirements was the big one. Uh, but there were others that were not minor. So, for example, um, licensing. Uh, DPDK is dual license, which means that, for example, people could, uh, could use proprietary code linked against uh, DPDK. And for that reason, um, despite the fact that DPDK was targeting Linux uh, as an operating system to start with, we were not going to use Linux kernel drivers as source code because those are GPL. So the first challenge was to basically take drivers which were coming from BSD, port them to Linux, and have them run in user space. It's a little bit of a problem, right? Um, to do that, we, we basically had to create an abstraction layer which allowed the porting first to different operating system, and then obviously a, an environment which uh, it's still called the runtime environment, DPDK, to basically allow you to run everything in user space. This environment basically allows you not to, to modify the source codes where you have system calls, etc. So it's all hidden for, for what really happens under the hood. Uh, and so there is going to be a, the, the least of the changes in the actual source drivers that you take with all the good benefits, because if there is a bug fix to, to a driver, you can just take it immediately. Um, eventually, uh, this all started as a POC, right? And, and uh, the, the, the it, we were meant to basically showcase that it was possible to achieve line rates by using just one core on a, on a CPU. Uh, then Six Wind uh, took, took it over open sourced it, and since 2013, like the community kept growing, and I, so I remember now there's like 160 uh, people contributing to it, uh, more than 25 companies, so it's, a, it's quite a, a big community of people. And most important NICs are supported by DPDK. Uh, can imagine many, Intel, Menlox, Broadcom, Qualcomm, you name them, they are all there, both in the kernel and, and in user space with DPDK. So to go a little bit through the architecture and 
how that, uh, that line rate was achieved in 2010, which is still like the architecture that exists today, is uh, DPDK stands for Data Plane Development Kit, although it's not just using it these days just for, for packet processing, but it's also used in areas like storage, for example. Um, it has to be said that one big thing, one big caveat is that the architecture completely bypasses the kernel stack, right? So what really happens is that you have your uh, network card, which is memory mapped to, to user space, and your drivers run in user space, and everything is done in user space. As you would imagine, one thing that uh, is pretty clear, all the goodies and all the functionality that the kernel offers in the various stacks, they're lost. So you, don't know, you no longer have uh, L2 functionality, you no longer have IP stack, you no longer have the L4 protocols, QoS, anything that you can come to, to comes to mind, it's lost. Everything has to be re-implemented in user space. Uh, the other part of the architecture is that it's a, uh, um, it has what's they're called the poll mode driver, so it's it's uh, basically working in polling mode uh, by obviously having a running, spinning thread consuming 100% of the CPU to be as fast as possible getting packets in and out of the NIC. And uh, mm, I do not see this. So, the, the, as I said, it runs a completion, uh, run to completion model, but it also supports a pipeline model, but it's not the default one. So, imagine that you want to build, for example, a very complex pipeline where you do packet processing and you need to move these packets around from one core to another, you can use the pipeline model. Uh, another interesting thing is because DVDK works in polling, what happens at Bootstrap is that it disables all NIC interrupts, obviously, because you don't longer need to be interrupted to, to, to get the packets out and from, from the network card. It does its own memory management system. Um, first of all, it leverages the uh, huge pages from, from the Linux uh, kernel, so it can be used both to meg huge pages or one gig huge, huge pages. Uh, the reason behind that is obviously that if you have a, a, a huge amount of packets reaching your network card and you want to process them as quickly as possible, those packets ha have to be represented in memory some, somehow, which is what happens in the kernel through the SK buffers. Um, and if you have millions of packets, that means possibly millions of structures that you have to host in memory and process them. By using the uh, huge page support, that means that there could be more buffers fitting in the same page, hence reducing what uh, a TLB miss is. Uh, less TLB miss means that the CPU works better. Um, there is less time spent by, uh, by the CPU having to, to, to get uh, translation for, for what really the hardware addresses are. Uh, what happens is that these huge pages, pages then are handled by, by DPDK. They're, they're uh, organized in, uh, in various segments. Each segment is divided into zones. But eventually, despite uh, the internal uh, organization of the memory, this is where uh, the RT buffers uh, and the mempools for, for DPDK actually leave. So anything that's moved around in DPDK lives in those huge pages. Uh, and, and this is a huge performance improvement overall, because imagine just, just think about what happens even at the memory space when you have a 4K page versus having a 2 meg page, how many more buffers you can fit in each page. Uh, another big uh, big thing in, in the PDK is that m most of the data structures used, uh, they are completely lockless. So there are all sorts of lockless queues and algorithms around making sure that you do not have to, for example, use either spin locks or uh, mutexes to, to, to access queues when a packet is either written to, to, the, to the buffer or read from the buffer. Uh, 
And again, that means less contention time on CPUs and less burning cycles just for, uh, for locking. One other big requirement is that you obviously need to use user I.O. support on your system, which uh, in some cases um, on some platform, the, when you have the UFI secure boots uh, enabled, that really means that you cannot have your I.O. Uh, and then in that case, the only way to to enable uh, DPDK and user spaces to, to use a specific driver, which is the, the FIO PCI one. Um, in fact, DPDK can use three different um, yeah, user, user IO drivers. One is the EFIO PCI, which is the one that I just mentioned, the IO, UIO PCI generic, and then it has also one that's shipped as part of uh, DPDK, which is the IGB UIO. Um, The, the choice is uh, is pretty much depending on the use case, but generally speaking, the VFI UPCI one is the most secure one, is the most used one above all in production because um, it does the support for the IOMU protection, etc. cetera. Um, I'm not gonna say anything new to, to you, obviously in order to, to to use uh, BFIO and friends, you need to enable the VTD in the BIOS, you need to enable uh, the um, uh, the IOMU support, whether being the Intel one or MD one at the kernel bootstrap, and, and then set it either to enabled or pass through, depending on what you need to do. Uh, but this is just standard knowledge. <coughs> so, uh, Obviously, we've been talking about a library which wants to send and receive packets, so how that, that is done. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the way that this happens is not different from what happens in the kernel. You have, uh, you have a buffer, uh, and eventually this, this data is, um, is gets either read from, from the DMA memory of the network card or written to it. Um, Again, what is interesting for, for people here, I suppose, because uh, you're familiar with the SK buffer, etc. cetera, uh, the, the uh, DPDK, because I was using drivers that were coming from BSD, obviously does not have a data structure that reminds the SK buffer, which is a huge data structure, but rather it uses the, um, the design from BSD of the M buffer. So there are many different places and links a data structure to represent a specific packet. Um, I'm just going quick, as I said at the beginning, this cannot be exhaustive, and I just have 10 more minutes, <laughs> so I'll go very quickly. Um, one thing that's, um, that has to be said about DPDK, besides you know, uh, the fact that it's uh, in user space and people may, may, may I think about you know all the features that uh, are getting lost through the fact that it's uh, kernel bypass. It has enabled a tremendous amount of use cases in, in recent years, above all in the SDN and F NFV area, uh, which were the most kind of demanding from an innov innovation perspective. Um, and uh, in fact, in the in, in that area, and uh, Antonio briefly touched upon it. You usually we usually talk about you know the back-to-back -back connection or uh, the PVP and PVPVP the type of uh, traffic where you basically have the east-west traffic on your on your server and not just traffic that hits your machine and then just leaves it. So you have traffic that can go from VM to VM and these days from container to container. Um, uh, what else to say here? Uh, wh one one big thing that has uh, that uh, has happened also in the past four or five years, and I will talk to you about just later on. Um, DPDK is the foundation of the two biggest uh, virtual switches uh, open source that are out there. One is the OpenV switch, and the other one is BPP. So the, it, it represents basically the foundation for those projects to, to accelerate the network in and out of a, of a server. I want to show you a chart, a graph, um, how the performance compare among different technologies. 
uh, and in different scenarios. I have on this graph also the XDP numbers, which um, is the, 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 the new approach to eBPF in the kernel. And the three different scenarios, the RX drop, which means just receiving packet and dropping them. Uh, imagine like a, a blind firewall that just blocks everything. Uh, TX push, which means you, you basically want to send packets out to the network and uh, a standard L2 forwarding. What's uh, really interesting in my mind, uh, beside the huge uh, performance throughput that DPDK shows, is uh, the closing up of the kernel networking throughput thanks to XDP. So, um, for example, if you, if you look at the TX push scenario, Sure, there are 20 million packets different between uh, the vectorized version of DPDK and uh, the IF uh, XDP poll, but it's also true that in that case your system is much less loaded, you're polling, your CPU can go to sleep, and in fact if you go and choose this, the, the first one, which is the random completion model of XDP, the gap is much, much closer. It's just like four or five million. Uh, and again, the reason why I wanted to show you this is not just as an absolute numbers for DPDK, but it's really like a, a, as, a, uh, as a very good feedback for uh, the kernel uh, as, a, as, a, as a piece of software, which is closing the gap which te with, with a technology that anyway bypasses all of it. Uh, in fact, if you're using XTP, you can still do whatever you want with the escape buffer that sits in the, in the kernel. So that's very quickly on it. BPP. Uh, as I said, um, I also linked this uh, project to, to my talk because DPDK bypasses the kernel, so you lose all the real functionality like IP, TCP, UDP, the QoS. BPP stands for vector packet processing and builds on top of DPDK, but can also use standard sockets. And it has a vast um, set of features. Uh, it, it implements a, full, a fully fledged TCP stack. As I said, I was uh, the implementer for SCTP. It implements all sorts of uh, um, overlay pr uh, protocols like VXLAN, Geneva. Uh, it just recently added support for Quick, uh, which is the, the, the multiple, well, it's the MTCP version advanced from Google. But what it, what it actually is, uh, first of all, there is a very important word in its name, which is vector. It's, a, it's an important qualifier because it's obviously opposite to scalar. And uh, before going into that details, I want to, to talk to you about the architecture of uh, how, the, how VPP looks like. It's a graph-based architecture, so every functionality exists in, in VPP is represented by a node. And because it's a graph architecture, each node has an incoming arch or many, an outgoing arch or many. Uh, this actually is the, is the way that uh, VPP can be easily extended with new functionality because anybody that wants to add a new feature, a new uh, all it has to, to, to do is to create a new node in the nomenclature and fashion of VPP, specify how the, the packets will flow in the node and where they go once they are out. And this is how you create a new functionality in, in VPP, um, which is a great way also for people like hardware vendors to create ad hoc node to offload specific functionality from VPP software to the hardware. It's just still just a node. Um, as I said, the important word here is not packet processing, but vector. And the reason being is that it completely flips the idea of, for example, how the, the kernel pa processes uh, packets, which is in the scalar way, which is even if they are batch read from the network card, um, they would still be going through the stack one by one. Instead, VPP basically batch reads 
uh, x number of packets, the, they are put into a vector, and the whole vector will flow through the through the node, uh, through through the graph, uh, and all packets in that vector will be processed. For example, for L2, then for L3, then for L4, etc. Why this is very important is because it actually uh, improves how the high cache works on on, C on modern CPUs, uh, and it uses the it uses a statistical approach to temporal temporal locality and how the actual flows come to your network to to to, to your network card, which is not surprising. Like imagine that you, for example, have a specific application. That application is doing any sort of processing, very likely a number of packets that you are receiving at any given time, it will be, for example, IPv4. It is very, very unlikely, and actually there is a study from Cisco about this. Um, it is very unlikely that in X number of packets, even a huge number of packets, you will be getting mixed IPv4 and IPv6. And based on that, uh, because you are, we are processing at, um, at every single node um, a specific layer in the, in the uh, L, L1, L7 stack, um, the instructions that are going to be executed to process those packets will always be in the cache. And the only packet that basically creates cache misses is the first packet that you process in the vector which is the warm, warmer for the cache. And the extra cost for the first packet is amortized over the whole vector of packets. Uh, this still works even in those scenarios where uh, for any reason in, a, in, a, in a, any vector of packets you, you get a packet that mismatch with the, with the assumption that is gonna be, for example, IPv4 only. In that case, the vector is, is split, and they follow two different paths. If you remember uh, uh, my previous, yes. You would have, for example, the node that processes IPv4 and the node that processes IPv6. Even in this case where you have to basically split the vector because of the inconsistency of the packets in the vector, the, the cost is still very, very low because next time the vector that you're going to process is much bigger. And again, the extra cost, the extra burden to warm up the cache is going to be amortized over more packets to be processed. So it's a very smart way to, to basically deal with uh, the high cache misses. Um, yeah, this, is, this approach has the has not only increases the the the, the performance on, on uh, just one time, but it's it's a better performance cost consistently, right? Because they are actually you can actually forecast how your performance will look like over time. Again, because you amortize the cost of misses across the 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 bigger uh, the bigger pool of packets that 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 has to be processed. It is very easy to, to extend its functionality. Um, as I said, it's a based on graph. You can create a new node and plug it in. Uh, and it also, in the project itself, it, has, uh, it, is, it is organized in a way where you, where you can find a plugins directory and you can start creating and working with the community upstream to add functionality through the plugins directory. Uh, another way would be to just create this functionality into the core of EPP, but somewhat it's much easier and better to start with the, with the plugins. Mm. And as I said, it's a, it's a very interesting aspect, not just for uh, software people, but also for hardware vendor that may want to, um, to offer this fun any type of functionality on, on the NIC itself, because offloading a specific piece of feature could just be represented by a node, right? Like, I don't know, an offload node. Uh, to conclude, it's, uh, uh, it has a very rich ecosystem. It 
is much more than what uh, many people uh, think about of VPP, which is just being a virtual switch. It is not. Uh, it supports level protocols. It can do obviously routing. Supports QoS through ACL. Supports mechanisms. Uh, it can be a firewall because through ACLs you can basically configure what you wanna get through your uh, through your uh, BPP and being forwarded or not. Um, it's in recent years, I would say a few years, uh, it, it also accelerates both the Kubernetes networking and uh, supports um, OpenStack too, uh, which basically means the two biggest open source projects for either containers or uh, well, VMs in the past and now also containers. Uh, it also has API programmability for SDN controllers like um, a, um, Open Daylight, for example. I, I, this is just like my perspective on things. Like uh, obviously uh, DPDK and VPP, they're not what people in the industry have been used for uh, many years, right? Uh, uh, it is definitely like an in innovative technologies. Um, VPP specifically has been always been uh, designed with uh, with a, a very clear view with how CPUs work, right? In order to get the, the, the most out of them. Um, I do believe that despite uh, not using them or integrating them in specific products is very important to, to getting to know them uh, and understand how they work and maybe leverage some of the ideas used to, to maybe elsewhere, like in the kernel if possible. And as I said, this was a very short introduction. It's impossible to, to speak about this in a very short amount of time, but now you know me and uh, if you would like to know more and talk more about this, please reach out. Questions? I don't believe I will make it in half an hour. <laughs> okay. You have a question. Wait. Wait. Maybe one question for everyone. Where do we ship it? Like, uh, is it part of our products? Is it not? Is it, you know? Yes. Okay. We have it in, uh, in our products, both DPDK and VPP.